Welcome to AWARE. We are dedicated to communicating information that inspires your positive growth and change. Are you interested in a peaceful planet? Are you interested in optimal health? Are you living with purpose? Are you enjoying your life? We realize each person can make a difference, and our mission is to empower your awareness. The choices that you make in every moment shape your life, and we encourage you to realize that you have your own answers and to always listen to your own truth. We invite you to stay aware. Hello, I'm Lisa Gar, and welcome to The Aware Show. It's a true joy and a privilege to be here with you and to share these informational messages that inspire our positive growth and change. That's the whole point of The Aware Show, and if you like it, you can listen to the podcast at any time by going to The Aware Show, wherever you hear your podcast, and you could share it with friends, which is always a wonderful way to carry over the learnings. If something inspires you, share it with a friend. It really helps you learn it even better. So today our conversation has to do with something that's very, very present in our space. It's a time where inclusion is essential and the polarization that we're experiencing of race is actually deadly. And we need to change the conversation. We need to bring about an entirely new conversation around diversity as a mindset shift, which is what my guest today, Sue bong Pier, has explained in her book, which is by that title, The Essential Diversity Mindset. It's about how to cultivate a more inclusive culture and environment. And the wonderful thing that Sue brings to this conversation and into her book is her over 30 years of experience as a global strategic marketer. So she has had the experience of knowing what all sorts of cultures and all sorts of races feel and experience. And she brings that into her very book, which is The Essential Diversity Mindset. Welcome, Sue bong Pierre. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And so I wanted to start off by asking you a little bit about your background, your experience in marketing. Did you or have you over the past 30 years experienced a global community in in all of your years of marketing or has it been divided mostly in the past? I think being together or being divided divided is really up to one's mindset and attitude. I've been always interested in learning about others, mind, other mindsets, people, cultures, and interested in learning about how people felt. So growing up in different parts of the world early on, I was exposed to differences, many differences. And when I got to, uh, to, my, to begin my career, I think it was more of a, a way for me to experience the globalness as well as the local cultures. So through marketing, I what I experienced was just the dealing with the colleagues from all over the world. And if we come to, came together as individuals without thinking about differences in race, skin color, or cultures, we got together much better. It was a wonderful experience. So you, where were you raised? Where did you grow up? I grew up uh, for the first about 14 years of my life in South Korea. Then we moved to Mexico City. My parents moved to Mexico City. So I was there for four years and completed my high school at the American school. And I believe that school's atmosphere and my experience gave me a lifelong land to see people as individuals. It was the, at the time, it was the only English speaking school um, in Mexico City. So we had students from all over the world, all different race, accents, and all that. And being, being different was a norm. And the only thing that set, differentiated us was by our names. And that's how I experienced the 
the diversity that works and healthy. So you learned at an early age how to see someone as a soul, as a human being. Yes. Because of the multicultural environment that you were in, right? Yes and no, because it's up to how people view others. You could be in a multicultural environment like the U.S. We have become a truly multicultural country more than any place I know. And yet we have a heavy divide going on right now. Yes. So it's a totally up to individual's mindset and lens how one sees others as an individual or a race, a label. Because it's a really important conversation. I really want to understand because we are experiencing such a deep polarization. And I, I wanted, my, my original question was, has it gotten worse in your experience? Has it always been this way? And then how do we start to heal this conversation? So let's go after that. Has it gotten worse? You know, I came here about 50 years ago. I date myself mm. and to go to college. And that was right after my life in Mexico City, especially in the American school. And what surprised me right away was how Americans label people. And I certainly realized I'm Asian minority. What does that mean? Right. And I don't think it's the fault of our population. I believe it with well-intended diversity paradigm that was based in based on race. Starting well-intended. Well, well, 1960s. Mm -hmm. it, the, you know, the prejudices and discrimination was rampant and we needed some kind of measure and I think it was a, it was right thing to do at that time at the time in 1960s the population of minority accounted only for 11 percent so the U.S. was a very much predominantly majority driven country okay and so what is it now what is, the what is now uh, the by 2020, which uh, the U.S. census are behind, we're about 40 percent, and by 2042, major minority will pass majority uh, by accounting 50.1 percent of population. Okay. So we live in a different mindset, different times, and. To give you an example how our mindsets have shifted, you know, in the U.S., interracial marriage was illegal until 1967. Wow. In 1959, the approval rate of marriage between whites and blacks was only 4%. By 2013, the approval rate has shifted to 87%. Wow. So wow. our mindsets has shifted, times have shifted, demographics, demographics is shifting, mm -hmm. and yet we're holding on to the same paradigm to advance diversity and inclusion, which is by race-based matrix. And I think there is a huge issue there. I love the statistics you just shared because we've come such a long way, and we are a melting pot in America and it is what exists and we have experienced such a uh, level a higher level according to your statistics of acceptance around interracial couples and gay marriage and all of these things that are now becoming cultural norms yes that we you know the to show that level of growth in the last 50 years is Amazing. So now you yes. say in by 2042, it will be 50-50. It will be yes. a, yeah, a, a more of a balance. And yes. so therefore, the word minority cannot be used any longer. Right. What, what would you say would be appropriate? Is it the word uh, human being? <laughs> An individual, a unique individual, go by name. So for example... If you 
you met me first, got to know me a little bit. You can describe me as, oh, she was a Korean, South Korean American. Versus you could say, you know, the person was so, and it, she happened to be South Korean. You're looking at me as an individual, not as a race. And I call that in my book, color neutral lens. What it means is that, of course, if we have two eyes to see, we see the differences, but those differences are irrelevant in our interaction with people because we meet the individual behind. And that opens the human space right away. It, it's, you know, it's great because we, um, we did an interview and the technology didn't work, which was actually a blessing because I got to know you better in that interview. That was the first time I had met you. And it was a little bit about getting to know each other first, but I was looking forward to coming back on the show with you yes. because I know you better now. I know that I can have a deeper conversation with you now. I, you, you are a lovely lady and very knowledgeable and have a peacefulness about you that has the potential of bringing together this very heated conversation. And so that's my experience of you. Thank you. And, Thank and you. So I'm really glad we had that opportunity to get to know each other more. Do you think if people got to know each other more, they would let go of or look beyond what looks different? I think two things have to happen. One, we have to shift our mindset and lens to see people as unique individuals. If that doesn't happen, you cannot open the space right away because they're we are feeling beings. I, can, I could feel when somebody treat me as a minority or somebody treat me as a unique individual. Mm. As soon, when somebody treat me with open lens, open-mindedness, it's a sue. That opens. The guardedness is diminished. Then we start getting to know each other and realizing, hey, we're not that different. No. I'm curious, do you experience it in a different way too? When you say that people treat you different, do you wind up acting different? To, to I often, a... for a long time, I often pondered, is it me? Is it them? Because all the interactions are two-way street, three-way street, many multi-ways. And I examined, you know, I, if I, when I felt self, a uh, strong sense of self, feel unique individual, I open up too. That changes that person, the other person's attitude. Because in our culture right now, people are guarded. They're afraid to say things. They're afraid to address somebody right, correct way. And they create so much stiffness. How can you cr create, have, human connection. So you, I appreciate your question. Sometimes it can be me. And then I have to realize, hey, it's me, not the person. And beside, if the person is biased and prejudiced person, there's nothing I can do about it anyway. Mm. Talk about that. That's an interesting perspective. So the point here is not to conform who you are or change who you are in a conversation. And the second piece of that is what you just said is super important. If somebody is racist or biased, you can't do anything about it. Is that true? You know, I, as I said, diversity is a mindset. It's about how we look, feel about, and interact with others. And in never mind about diversity, any human changes that we want to expand develop, it has come from within. Nobody can change us. Whatever people call me, how I feel about myself won't change. There will always be racists. There will always be people who discriminate against. However, my hope is the more we can create this human space will have a rippling effect to have help 
people to kind of ponder. Is, am I a racist? Am I biased? And by the way, I think we use the word racist too pervasively. Without me knowing and having the actual fact about a person is a truly racist, I don't think I have a right to call anybody a racist. Mm. And that, mm. cre- that only create that insights resentment because we never know about what others think anyway. So making a gross obs- assumption creates a lot of resentment. That is a great point. So inside of you, if you are not experiencing racism, then outside, outwardly, you can't be experiencing it either. You have to heal it within yourself first. Yes. The self-empowerment is a huge piece in how we can move toward voluntary inclusiveness. When we, What we feel about others are oftentimes a projection of how we feel about ourselves. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and there's a, the only variable in the equation is myself to feel good about myself, to feel I am a capable individual trying to make a, some contribution to the society I live and bring people together. I think that's, that's all we can do. Well, you are a capable individual. And, you can. <laughs> and so what inspired you from being a marketing strategist to writing a book about diversity? I think what inspired me, I started in marketing, I did a mostly corporate world work, which I enjoyed. Then I always wanted to do something to help people. So I moved into um, leadership development being an executive coach. It was fulfilling to help people to have more in their life. And then I stopped working for a while. And by just witnessing the divide in this country, it really pained me. And also the way diversity is viewed here is about as a formula. It's far more than that. So with my concern by witnessing the growing divide, that prompt me to say, okay, I want to share that diversity can be looked from the different light. So that's how so I you, decided to write. You did it because you really wanted to make a difference and you yes. really wanted to, to impart. And I remember from the last time I spoke about with you, you said, after the interview was over, you said, if I just changed one person's life as a result of this conversation, then I've done my job. Yes. And I remember saying that. So tell me who that person would be. What would be the impact you'd want to make? I think the biggest impact I can make if they'll read it or will actually reflect on it are leadership, our leaders, our media. I wanted them to look at what am I doing? Is this for my own personal agenda or is it for the people I lead? Because we need a unity and they're not acting to promote the unity. I'm not trying to you know, criticize anybody, but that's where it has to come. Tell me how the conversation would, you would like to hear it sound. Is it to not bring up the identity of the person first and bring up the humanity of the person first? Reshape it for me. I think they have to realize the pervasive racial labeling. Separate people. It creates a stereotyping and it promotes racism. The language. The, just to, by, by talking about they, I mean, think about how we label. Politicians label people, media label everyone. If they can even, re- I'm not saying we shouldn't have diversity goals. I'm saying let's change behavior so that we can promote more inclusiveness, more unity. And that's, if they can do that, and if they're acting as they are treating everyone as equal beings, 
the message will be so powerful. It will bring pe people feel, oh, I'm not going to be looked at as this, or I don't have to worry about saying some things. It should just change the climate. Right now, our climate is not sustainable. And I'm concerned, very concerned. I am too, I know. And the way to change it then is through languaging, feeling into your heart about soul connections with yes. human beings mm -hmm. and remembering that we're a humanity that we're not separated by what we look like is to it really comes down to the core of judgment doesn't it yes it, and if you're judging yourself extremely hard which people tend to be very self-critical and very judgmental of themselves and then as you said that's a projection for other people judging other people. So if I'm going to judge myself that harshly, then I'm going to judge everyone else. So really at the basis of this is to start to heal the judgment mm -hmm. that of others not being like you and the judgment of yourself being completely critical of yourself. If we could really rise above judgment, it would be a much better place. Yes. And really. another piece there is if we can identify ourselves as a, a unique individual, not as a race. When I, if I label myself, I'm an Asian minority, that reduces me. When I feel, you know what, I'm a unique individual and I have a full life with me. That changes the whole narrative. And if most of us can do that, it will be a fantastic world. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely well i love that world and i'd love to live in it with you and, <laughs> and um i understand that you live in a in a mountain town and it's beautiful up there in utah and that it's just a, a beautiful wonderful environment do you like it in utah yes the uh, the weather is well in winter time it's cold but i still like the crisp coldness anyway and it's open for open environment and we don't because we can go out without worrying it's been a pleasure to be uh here during especially this pandemic i feel guilty to be here <laughs> and then thinking about all those people who have to be you know how do you in a in in more walk. compact areas yes. yeah it, yes it's harder to get out when you're a little bit more spread out in the mountains your life hasn't been that impacted as like living in a big city right. so yes. yeah i feel for them yeah well, we will be out very soon yes we can heal this virus we can heal this con this re racial divide we can heal our environment we have a lot of healing to do but i think these conversations help us move into the right direction yes. so thank you thank, thank you. you so much it's been a pleasure getting to know you and I'm glad the first interview didn't work out so I could get to talk to you again. So thank oh, you. Right. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and it's feel so refreshing to be able to share um, my perspective without being scrutinized or criticized. So it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. How about how about to do it with a lot of respect? because I have an enormous amount of respect for you. What you've done with 30 years of global marketing is absolutely amazing. And that you've written a book and that you're a mom and all of the other wonderful things, you're a wife, all of the wonderful things that you are. It's not only without being scrutinized, but it's with being totally respected. So thank you. Thank you so much. That's very empowering to hear that. Right. Appreciate it. Absolutely. As with everyone, I and do the keep, same thing. <laughs> and keep up with their good work to have to raise the awareness of where, where we can be, what we can do and wh where we can be. That's a fantastic work and it's so needed in today's environment. Yes, it so is. So thank you. Thank you so much. Sue Bung here is my guest and the book is called The Essential Diversity Mindset, How to Cultivate a More Inclusive Culture and Environment. I will be right back. I'm Lisa Gar, and you're listening to The Aware Show. Welcome back to The Aware Show. I am Lisa Gar, And did you know that there are over 17 million deaths due to heart attacks worldwide each year? 
And there are also those who survive. We hear a lot about the statistics around those who don't survive, but what about the statistics of those who do survive? And what about life after the survival of a heart attack? There's so many things that probably go through people's minds about mortality, about, about purpose, about loved ones, uh, what if factors. There's probably an enormous amount of depression and uh, just shock and recovery that goes through someone's mind. We are being joined today by Brian Simpson, who is one of those survivors, and he is on his five-year anniversary of surviving a massive heart attack that he had at the young age of 47 years old. And the heart attack led to a spiritual awakening, a growth, and a journey that he now calls his journey of the soul. And he, Brian is a, a cyclist. He's an avid cyclist. We ride together occasionally. He rides in front of me, way in front of me. <laughs> but his team of doctors said that he would never probably be riding. And now cycling is saving his life. So welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Lisa, for having me. Uh, truly an honor. Yeah, it's good to see you without a helmet on. And it's good to see you healthy. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's so funny when we see each other when we're not on a bike we don't have our helmet on. We look so different, right? I know. We look so different. Um, I'm used to seeing the back of you, though, because I'm usually behind you. And it is amazing how strong you are. Were you a cyclist before your heart attack? I was, yeah. I've been a cyclist for you know most of my life. Um, took a brief hiatus around the time my son was born when I was in my um, late 20s, early 30s. Uh, picked it back up again. And you know I've been riding pretty hard ever since. I, I mean, I have to ask you, do you ever, are you ever worried that you're raising your heart rate too high, that you're pushing yourself too hard? Like, I feel that I, my heart's going to jump out of my chest, but you don't seem to have a problem with it. I I, I don't, honestly. I, I really try, Lisa, to focus on what I what I want, right? I, I'm a big believer that mindset and and our thoughts are super powerful, and so I don't want to focus on something um, that I that I don't want to happen. I focus on you know what I want and on thriving. I call it the thriver mindset. Um, you know, I also have had uh, significant testing after my heart attack uh, because I was a cyclist. They did tell me that riding a bicycle saved my life. At six months, they sent me for really what would be considered extreme testing for someone who's had a heart attack, uh, essentially a full on step test, VO2 max test, which was done in Toronto. And uh, at the end of the test, like I, I literally put numbers up that were almost identical to what I had done eight years previously to that. And, you know, the doctors literally, there was two cardiologists that were in the room and they said, like, why are you here? Like, why did you want to have this test done? And I, I looked at Dr. O, who's you know, world renowned for his work in cardiac rehab. And I said, Dr. O, I want to know what I can do, not what I can't do. Oh, nice. So you have apparently changed your life drastically since before the heart attack. Looking back on it, would you say that you would have changed without that heart attack? Sadly, no, I don't think I I would have. I really, uh, looking back, you know, after my sort of awakening, my spiritual awakening, um, that was kind of a sleep at the wheel. Um, blinders full on. I wasn't really open to possibilities. I was a bit of a negative Nelly, um, you know, judgy. Uh, you know, not really uh, operating what I would call above the line, you know, behavior, super competitive, uh, just, just, yeah, I don't, I really don't think that I would have. And I really, like I said, I look at my heart attack as not just a gift, but as a teacher, it, it was really something that I needed. I needed to be one of those people that you sometimes you just got to shake to, uh, to wake up. Were you, were there any signs that you were um, that you were uh, had a lot of hypertension, that you had rage, that was there anything going on that would have clued you in? 
Uh, no, not really. Not, you know, again, health wise, pretty, you know, pretty normal. No, no blood pressure issues, no real cholesterol issues, issues. Before I, uh, in 2008, I rode across Canada for a kid's cancer charity and I had a full cardiac workup done and they, they said, you you look great. You're good to go. Um, they did notice that I did have low HDL, which is the good cholesterol, but it's, it wasn't a risk factor, no real significant family history history. So no, but again, I, 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 I know now, and I look back on it, I didn't handle stress very well. And um, I was a pharmaceutical rep, I jokingly call it a drug dealer for almost 20 years. Uh, it was a great job, but you know, again, when stress came into my life, I didn't really handle it very well. I, I you know, didn't have meditation that I have now as a tool that helps keep me calm and grounded and centered. Um, I, I really believed I couldn't meditate. I thought it was just something wrong with me. Um, you know, very much a negative self-talk person as well. Really, I wouldn't say what I would say to myself to any human being, you know, but yet I was you're really berating myself um, and, and, you know, and angry. I, I, I definitely had anger issues as well. Stemming from anger issues, stemming from what? Well, I, again, I I struggled to understand why, you know, why I would go into these these fits of anger. Um, but in in the journey since my heart attack, in the five years since my my journey, um, the realization that that um, I was sexually molested when I was seven years old. So for forty years, I kept that a secret. It was you know the guilt, the shame that's around that I've. You know, I work with a trauma coach to work through it. I'm still, I'm going to be working through this for the rest of my life. But I, at least now, I know I have um, some answers, which which has been that in of itself. It's just been like a weight has been lifted. When you say you're going to be working through it the rest of your life, that's a, that's a really honest and open thing to say. It's not like you ever 100% get over that. Do you learn to live with it? What is the survival of that like? Well, it, again, it's a journey. I mean, life is, in my belief, you know, uh, this this particular life I'm in, this body, you know, it will end when I leave this body. But the journey never ends. And uh, I believe, you know, in terms of my awakening that I'm carrying with me traumas from past lives, from, from generational trauma. I, I, I believe that sincerely. I, I've done a lot of work. Um, in this area as a life coach you know we have to be informed about trauma I, I don't coach around trauma but i had to be informed about it to get my certification and it's just it's a journey i mean it, it, it's trauma is really tricky it, the ego is there kind of protecting it and and i think that's where my my anger came from it was it was a mechanism to protect that hurt little boy inside um you know, I shielded myself with that, and uh, I never really let anybody in. I never really truly opened my heart up to anybody. Um, it was your armor. It was something that you it, held in front of you. Yes. It was. It was my armor. Yeah. It was like a like a, I call, I considered it like I had put this this lock around my heart and threw away the key. Mm. And so, in what way did the heart attack break that open for you? Well, the first thing is it made me realize that. Uh, something needed to change. Uh, I also had two near-death experiences. One at 15, I was in a car accident. They said that no one should have survived and I walked away. And then at 18, I almost bled to death um, from a, a birth defect that had ruptured in my abdomen. And But at 15 and 18, you know, you're really, you're not really even thinking big picture. And it was the realization around six, seven months after my heart attack when someone had asked me, you know, how did it change you? And I'm like, well, how didn't it change me? And then I started to really think about it. It's like, wow, like not only did I dodge a bullet with this heart attack, but twice before that I've had near death experiences, but they didn't really land. But this time it landed. And the cliche, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. That's what my heart attack was, the teacher. It, it was your teacher. So you really had several br brushes with death before your heart attack. So it was almost like the universe is trying to wake you up. So have you ever thought that now that you are aware of this and now that you are awake, that it puts you on even more of a mission to help people? Uh, absolutely, it does. It, it's it's given me a sense of purpose. I've been on a crazy journey. My story is, we could talk for a long time about it. Like I said, I went to India and Nepal on a spiritual quest, um, came back, bought a motorcycle, did a solo motorcycle trip from Canada all the way to Costa Rica and back, 
tell you spending that much time alone you know on a motorcycle very meditative in your in your thoughts in your head i I, if I could wring my helmet out, the tears that, that would come out of that helmet, I, at least I can't tell you how many times I'd just be driving down the highway and just be just sobbing, like, but good tears, like healing to you, like cleansing, you know, and it would be about a memory or a song I was listening to that all oh, in that moment just was like it was meant for me, you know, those types of moments happened more times than I can count. Yes. <laughs> was Now, that was after your heart attack. And it was. so that's brave to go on a missionary journey like that with yourself. You really wanted to get to the bottom of it, didn't you? Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I couldn't have, I couldn't have communicated. I, I had many people ask me, why are you doing this? Why this crazy? It's dangerous to go do that. And, and I, I, I never looked at it that way. I, there was something inside of me that was telling me that I needed to go away that I needed to to seek some answers. I needed to to be with myself because I honestly, at that point before my heart attack, I really didn't like the man that I was becoming. And uh, and I knew that I needed to to just get away and just be with me, you know? And, and it's really, it's an interesting journey when you spend that much time alone. And, um, you know, because you, you start to see the cracks, you start to see, you know, the armor. And and it starts to over time as you as you work through it, they, they start to fall a piece uh, apart. The the pieces of armor that you know you had around yourself, you become open. You start to listen to your intuition, and not just listen to it, but trust it. And I think there's a difference between listening to it and trusting it. And I I honestly say I, I trust my intuition with my life. It, it served me well on my trip. Wow. That's a great thing to say. Would you suggest somebody who's been through a heart attack that wants to go back to living life the way they did before, to take the time to really do a deep dive and kind of go into this place of vulnerability? Absolutely. I, I there's such a, a, a there's a process that that happens. Like you mentioned, depression, anxiety. It's really, really significant. It's 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 really high in uh, in people that have had heart attacks. Um, anxiety, especially. Like, am I going to have another one? You asked me in the beginning. You know, are you worried that your heart rate's too high? And I, I don't I don't think that way. But right. you know, there was there was some time in the very beginning where, you know, I. I I didn't know. Like, I, there was one one moment through this whole journey where I was I was out on a bike ride. I was still on a lot of medications because they give you a lot of medications after a heart attack, and I felt terrible. I cried because I'm like, if this is what my life is going to be like, I don't know if I can do this. I actually thought that. Uh, it turned out it was one medication. It's called a beta blocker, which is meant to slow your heart rate, so your heart can kind of heal. And the second they stopped that. I went for a ride. I cried again, but I cried this time because it was joy. It was like, okay, I feel like I'm myself again. You know, I feel like normal. And so that was a pivotal moment for me in, in that experience. And, you know, it's, it's really important. And sadly, Western medicine doesn't talk a lot about depression and anxiety. Um, it doesn't talk about stress. Like I, I've never had anybody in, in the medical team that cared for me. And I was part of a clinical trial. So I had extra care that you wouldn't normally get and not once did anyone ask me how are you doing you know are you are you depressed at all are you struggling at all not once it was just your numbers your numbers your numbers it was your how numbers. You, yeah. yeah yeah how are you feeling in terms of fatigue but not emotionally not emotional. i mean i i definitely want people to know that if you have heart issues or if you've had a heart attack please consult your doctor this is not medical advice but at the same time i want you to you know more people die of heart attacks than of cancer every year. And it is important that we look at the quality of our heart, of our life. I'm not talking about the, the oxygen in your heart. I'm talking about the quality of our life and how much, how kind are we being to ourselves? You, you are called the Kindfulness Coach and that is the website, kindfulnesscoach.com. But what does that mean? in terms of being kind to yourself? Well, like I said, I, I can't take full credit for the name. I, I have this here with me today. This is the book that I, I kind of borrowed the name from. It's from uh, Buddhist monk Ajahn Brahm. Um, it's basically, don't just be mindful, be kindful. It really struck a chord with me. I've got to meet with him, got to talk with him. Like I said, I'm a recovering negative self-talker. Um, you know, I still catch myself, but I have that awareness to it now. But 
kindfulness just really resonated with me because I, I wasn't very kind with myself. I mentioned earlier that I, I, I would say things to myself that I wouldn't say to any other human being. And, uh, and why was that okay? And, uh, and so it's about kindfulness is mindfulness with kindness and compassion for others, but more importantly for ourselves, because I think we, 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 social media puts pressure on us. Life puts pressure on us. There's, there's, there's constantly pressure on us. And, and if we can't, I'm one of my favorite words is grace. When we can't give ourselves grace, that, that it's okay not to be okay. Mm. you know and realize it doesn't mean anything you know it's not it doesn't mean you're broken I was raised by a very self-critical uh, parent and um, I learned self-criticism at a very early age and so long that it became comfortable like that was my familiarity zone was to criticize myself to not be good enough and to always um, be less than to the point where I created like this whole drama of winning this national award and being put in front of the school for it and then getting chastised by the nuns because I was not programmed to allow anything other than my worst self to show. Mm. And what I had to do to undo that took me 30 years, <laughs> 30 years to undo that, to actually teach myself how to catch the thought before it comes in because my I really dissected this and maybe you can talk to me about this but I really felt the thought come in as a comfort comfort it was a comfort thought do you know what I mean yeah yeah self yeah, I, mean. mm -hmm. yeah, I, I when I'm working with clients one of the things like I love the name of your show the aware show because awareness is everything you can't change it something that you're not aware of and uh, and catching it you know once you gain that awareness then you have the ability to catch it and it's it's something I've learned from from a coach of mine it's, it's called catch and release it's it's catching it in the moment not just catching it happening but the feeling of it I think it's really important that the feeling of it is is important for you to catch as well and to acknowledge it but then to say no not now and let it go and then get back to what you're what you're trying to do, and and it's really it's a it's a it's a simple sounding technique, but it, it takes practice. And there's an element to it that I think is really important, and that's that's acknowledging and, and literally like giving yourself a, a pat on the back, like, you know, that's a big thing. Celebrating it, I think it it kind of I think ingrains it, imprints it more when we when we actually take a moment to say, wow, I, I caught myself that time. Yep, yep. I I mean, look, the exercise is a big piece of it because the patterns of the negative thinking groove a little pattern in the brain. So can the patterns of the positive thinking or the forward thinking. They can groove new patterns in the brain. So we go out on these bike rides and they're really, really hard. And I know that I'm not gonna stay with the group, but when I come home, that's not what I'm thinking. I come home saying, I did that today. Yes, I got two and a half hours of really hard intensity workout in my body likes it. It needs it actually yeah. to have that hit cardio. And I don't look at it as I didn't keep up with you guys and I cut out half the route. I don't care. I went out, I go out there with you and my family and you know, lots of other people that are really strong and I love it. I love it. I look forward to Wednesday mornings. And so it's definitely a practice to learn how to regroove the brain's ability to carve a new pattern and to enjoy it and to put yourselves in situations that you can actually have fun and enjoy life. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I mean, happiness at the end of the day, isn't that why we're here? You know, is to be happy and to enjoy life. And, and, and you know, I, I don't want to, I call myself the heart attack thriver. Just something came to me one day in a conversation. But really, I mean, who wants to say that at the end of their life that, well, I survived it, you know, it's like, I want to say that I thrived, that I lived it, you know, I did it right, whatever that looked like for me, you know. So how much does it help you to pay it forward when you're helping people and coaching people? How much does that help your quality of life? Oh, it's, it's immense. It's the, the joy that I get from seeing somebody who comes to me stuck in a story, stuck in their limiting beliefs and to see them move through it, move past it and beyond it. It's so rewarding uh, to see that and to be part of that journey. You know, coaching is, is really, it's about just helping someone see 
what's already inside. We, I believe we have all of the answers. It's all there for us. It's all laid out. We just we just have to learn how to tap into it. And if I can, through my gift, help someone access their own gift, then then it doesn't really get much better than that. I I, I come off of calls, you know, and and I'm just. I'm like just literally vibrating. I'm just so happy that it's gone, you know, it's gone when it's gone well, you know, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful thing. I, I love the whole pay it forward. Uh, it's a real big part of how I operate. Um, it's, now, it's my passion. Do you do mostly men's coaching or is it heart attack th- survivors or who is uh, your, the main people that you coach? So it's 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 a great question because it's been it's literally it's literally evolving as I uh, go. I've created um, this with this heart attack thriver. I've created a um, Instagram account where I interview other people that have had heart attacks or events of the heart. I bring on doctors and nurses and people who are in the space. Uh, and again, just to raise awareness to the role that stress plays in our bodies, that that it leads to dis ease in our bodies, which I believe is is behind a lot of illness. It's not just cardiovascular disease. The inflammation that happens when we're in a state of disease. Um, I, I actually so initially it was it was more uh, women in the beginning. Um, it was relationship stuff. It was you know coaching around. I because I was you know 47, newly single. You know I was in the dating scene for a while, so I had you know some perspective on that, and I had women that were you know approaching me about how how to navigate it. Um, but it's fully changed and it's changed with this heart attack driver. Now my clients are coming to me that are people that have had heart attacks that are struggling, that are looking for some help to, to move in a, in a new direction, uh, to go through something I've coined the grieving of the loss of your old self. It's, I think it, it's, it's something that happens with any near death experience. You, you could probably speak to that too, because when you have something like I had or your, your, your bicycle crash, you know, you, you have to come to a new normal and, and, and it's not easy. It's not easy getting there. Cause you, you, you want to be your old self in, in some ways. I, I, there's a lot of things about me that I, I, I'm happy that I can still hold on to my fitness and my love of cycling and, and I'm able to do it. But if I had that taken away from me, which some people are their their heart is so badly damaged. They, they struggle to, to do a lot of the things that they could do, like I remember in cardiac rehab, which for people out there that are watching, cardiac rehab is is such a critical appointment, a, a, a part of the recovery after a heart attack. And there was people there that could barely walk around the hall. And they're telling me, Brian, we need you to run <laughs> because we've got to oh. get your heart rate up. And you feel you feel guilty. You almost you have this survivor's guilt that you're thinking, like, I'm doing so well. These people are looking at me and and you feel you feel it. Right. And I had a client recently, uh, a friend who um, he said, I actually look at it now as survivor's responsibility. It's my responsibility as a survivor to give back, to help others, to try and elevate people. And, and that's, that's kind of where it is for me right now is, is really looking at this, this responsibility I have to pay it forward, to pass my gift on. It seems like living with this level of purpose has completely changed your life. And you really listen to the call. Maybe the first two times you didn't. The third time was like, all right, if you're not going to listen, we're not going to let you keep, stay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. Three is my number. I, I don't know. Three is showing up in my life in so many times. So three near-death experiences. Um, you know, I, I three is just a big number. Three and 33 are two numbers that constantly appear in my life. And uh, I was told that the in numerology, 33 means the universe has your back. And I, I truly believe that. I believe I have, you know, a guardian angel that's watching over me. Um, I felt that when I had my heart attack, I didn't realize it in the moment, but when I look back on it now, I, I realized that there was, there was a sign I had, had this gold orb I saw when I was having my symptoms. And uh, I realized now I really think that was my angel saying, I got you. I got you this one more time. Have you seen the gold orb since? I have not. I have not. Uh, what I will say is I've had an opportunity to meet with a lot of people that were and, and keep in touch with people that were really important in me, not only surviving, but thriving. And, and that's been because those people have all were also my angels that were there for me that, um, you know, made sure that I got the care I needed. And, and uh, you know, they're a big part of why I'm thriving. Angels in human form. Yes. yes. I, I think I shared with you before that the, the gentleman who found my body when I was down at the bottom of a ditch. Um, I will always remember and be grateful for every time I see him. It's just, it's not even a, a question. He doesn't feel it the same way I feel it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, somehow God tapped you to find my body 
Steve Weston. I, I will always give him credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I uh, like I said, it's uh, Len Van Pelt was the paramedic that kept me calm, uh, and Malcolm Quigley, who was the police officer friend. So I, I was a former hockey player as well as with me, and uh, you know he was the first one that came to me and saw that something was wrong, and he started the whole chain of events that happened. And um, you know I have a saying: if there was a checkbox or a checklist of of things you need to do not just survive but thrive all the boxes were ticked for me. And, and that's why I'm, I'm a thriver, not a survivor. So when's your book coming out? Uh, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm actually working on it. I've, um, I've started, you know, I'm getting a template, a little a layout for it, but I, I, I definitely have a book in me, Lisa. And, uh, you know, I, know I, you I do. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to do it. I'm, I'm a storyteller and, and it's, it's going to, it's going to be hard to drill it down because there's just so much. Right. But, uh, no, I, I, I said, it's, it's something that uh, has really been really present for me lately. And, and thank you for, uh, for asking me about that and, and calling me forward because I'll, I'll say it today that it's coming. I'm, I'm working on it. It's, it's, uh, it's in me. It's got to come out. I mean, you have an extraordinary story. You do you, I mean, and one that many men, can relate to but don't know it yet living under the stress of unresolved emotional issues that they might not even be aware of and how that comes out and it lashes out at people around you that you love um you had mentioned to me that you were married the first time and that since then you've resolved that uh, um relationship with your ex-wife and took responsibility for things that weren't so great for you, right? Yeah, I think it was important for her to heal as well. I mean, when when a marriage ends, which is, you know, no one no one sets out to end their marriage, but when it does happen for whatever reason, you know, I really felt it was important for me to 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 share with her, you know, my understanding it not to not to say what I did was okay or 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 that but just to say like I'm sorry, like I I understand now why I was angry, why I was operating from that place where I, I didn't let you in. I, I didn't really let you in. So how could you love me back when I never let you in, you know? Mm. And so I just wanted to say, it's me. It was never you. Wow. That was probably wonderful for her to hear. And for you to say, mm. for you to come to that realization as well. And that level of responsibility that you can even say that to me now shows that that is resolved. So your relationship now that you have, is it a much more open, talkative relationship where you let someone in? Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I am my, my new partner, Adrian, who I met on my motorcycle trip. Uh, it's a completely different relationship. And it's because it's an intentional relationship. It's a deliberate, inf you know, communication. I Communication is everything. If you don't have strong communication as a couple, it's going to be a challenge. And uh, I love it. She's she's very strong. She's um, she doesn't put up with anything. She's she calls me forward if uh, if I if I'm operating below the line, she'll say, hey, like I'm not I'm not digging that. And uh, you know, and it's and we 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 can have those hard conversations, which I wasn't able to with my former wife. Sadly, I wasn't able to have those hard conversations. And Adrian and I can do that. And it's, uh, you know, we, we both have said it on many times. It's like, I love you more after this conversation because of how we handled it together than I did before. You and know? you can handle things in life that way too. Yeah, you when you have, you know, when other things break down like pandemics and things happen in the world, you have that base, that strength, and that means the world. Well, I mean, you really are an inspiration to people. And I'm going to say specifically men that, have that guarded heart that don't want to let others in because it was hurt or damaged. And you are truth that if you harbor that, it could wind up in an illness. And if you truly come to terms with it and start to work with it, it can lead to a life of thriving and your proof that that actually is possible. Well, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. And it is, it is true. It is. And if you look at suicide rates, uh, especially in men, that's a big part of it. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done to heal a lot of the broken men out there that um, that have been hurt, that have been traumatized, and they have been taught to suck it up and, and keep it inside. And internalizing it is, it's, it's gonna come out. Unfortunately, it's gonna come out one way or the other. See what I mean? You're a good inspiration. So thank you for encouraging people to talk, to feel, 
to be vulnerable, it's okay, and it leads to a life of freedom, and it doesn't hurt you, and it you stop hurting yourself, and you stop hurting others. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. All right, well, the web, so the Instagram is the Kindfulness Coach. There, so there's two, there's the Kindfulness Coach on Instagram, and then there's the Heart Attack Thriver. They're two separate entities, uh, but both of them are me. <laughs> okay, uh, and so one is specific around heart attack, and the other one is around the coaching. That's right. That's right. Well, check Brian Simpson out on Instagram and uh, be a part of his show, participate, chime in, which is really great because feedback is always important. And it's a nice intimate setting to um, Instagram is. So very cool. All right. Well, I look forward to your book coming out. And <laughs> if you would like to share this interview with a friend or if you know somebody who might be in the situation of, of needing to be more vulnerable or who has issues with with surviving post heart attack, then please share this interview with your friends. You can go to my podcast, which is the aware show and share it with your friends and put in a comment there. And that's the whole point is to pay forward the information that inspires your positive growth and change. So you can help others. Thank you so much, Brian. And until next time, I invite you to stay aware. Mm -hmm.